Good evening, Pastor Carr. Thanks. 
John. We appreciate it. Let us stand. Let us begin our worship, though. Open this up.
But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ. For it is by God's grace that you are saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves, it is a gift from God. According to his word and promise, I declare to you the forgiveness of all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. You are washed clean in the blood of Christ. Rejoice, you are forgiven. You are alive in Christ. Thanks be to our God. Amen. Please be seated for the reading of God's word. Our Old Testament reading for tonight is from the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 49, starting at verse 11. For you, this whole vision is nothing but words sealed in a scroll. And if you give the scroll to someone who can read and say to him, read this please, you will answer, I can't, it is sealed. Or if you give the scroll to someone who cannot read and say, read this, please, he will answer, I don't know how to read. The Lord says, these people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is made up only of rules taught by men. Therefore, once more, I will astound these people with wonder upon wonder. The wisdom of the wise will perish. The intelligence of the intelligent will vanish. Woe to those who go to great depths to hide their plans from the Lord, who do their work, who do their work in darkness and think, who sees us, who will know? You turn things upside down as if the potter were thought to be like the clay. Shall what is formed say to him who formed it, he did not make me? Can the pot say of the potter, he knows nothing? In a very short time will not Lebanon be turned into a fertile field, and the fertile field seem like a forest. In that day the deaf will hear the words of the scroll, and out of gloom and darkness the eyes of the blind will see. Once more, the humble will rejoice in the Lord. The needy will rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. Our epistle reading is from Ephesians chapter 5, starting at the 21st verse. All right. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church his body, of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it, just as Christ does the church. We, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must love his wife as he loves himself. The wife must respect her husband. Would you please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel tonight? Our Gospel reading comes from Mark chapter 7, starting at the first verse. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law, who had come from Jerusalem, gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were unclean, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash, and they observe many other 
traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, Why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders, instead of eating their food with unclean hands? He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you, hypocrites, as it is written. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to the traditions of men. And he said to them, You have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. But you say that if a man says to his father or mother, whatever help you might otherwise have received from me is korban, that is, a gift devoted to God, then you no longer let him do anything for his father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and you do many things like that. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you that you have given all authority and dominion to your Son, Jesus Christ, who by his perfect life, death, and resurrection, won the gospel for the world, won the good news, won the redemption, the forgiveness for all. Lord, everything that falls under our King of Kings, Jesus Christ, Lord, um, is a part of this world. We ask that you would teach us to learn in, that you would teach us to grow in, that you would teach us to follow you, even when it's hard, Lord, as the church. Uh, tonight, I ask you to bless the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts. May be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's uh, sermon request is not only a relevant topic for the life of the church militant. That's what we are, the church militant. That is the church still in the battle on the earth. The question is how we understand tonight what we owe to the governing authorities in terms of subjection, in terms of obedience. What an important topic. It's not only relevant, but I'm glad I saved this question till almost last because of the relevance of this biblical question for this day. It's not only a relevant topic for the days of COVID and other current trending topics, but it's especially apropos for this week. A week we have experienced that is kind of a setback for us. At least that's how I kind of see it. A new state health order that requires us once again to wear our masks. I won't grab my mask. To wear our masks inside in public spaces. Whether you agree with the science or not, as presented, whether you find that wearing masks is a mild convenience or a huge infringement on your personal rights, whether you have been sick with COVID or not, whether you are afraid of COVID or not, we all have an important question to ask. And that important question is not, is this a good state health order? The answer to that question is irrelevant. The question we must ask as the church is, what is our response going to be to this health order? Not health option, or suggestion, or favor, or encouragement, but in order. As you are sitting here today, you know the decision already Emmanuel Lutheran Church has made. Our decision is to follow the health order. Myself, along with the deacons of Emmanuel, in keeping with how we have navigated through things and how we have practiced things, again, with much difficulty, made the decision to subject this congregation to the imposition that is the mask. 
for this time. So you know the decision. You know the answer. So now let's go back and see how we arrived there. And towards the end of this sermon, we'll ask an all-important question, what about civil disobedience? To start today, I'd like to start where many of us started, in catechism class. In Luther's small catechism, which begins with the Ten Commandments. Those Ten Commandments which frames, which sets limits, and leads us into the desires of a God and his created world. Here is the explanation to the fourth commandment, as you have probably memorized it at some point. What does this mean? We should honor our father and our mother. We should fear and love God so that we do not despise or anger our parents, kids, listen up, and other authorities. But honor them, serve and obey them, love them and cherish them. So, we owe something to authorities, just as we do to our parents. We owe them honor and obedience. You owe honor and obedience to the authorities. And if that makes you cringe, or makes you nervous, or leaves a bad taste in your mouth, that's for two reasons. Number one, because our authorities are sinful. And number two, because you are sinful. We have a hard time swallowing this pill for good reason. We live in a broken world. We know that people in places of authority are not always trustworthy, are not always good. We know that people in places of authorities are not always right in their decisions and in their actions. And to further complicate and potentially exacerbate this awkwardness, we hear from the famous Romans passage, Romans chapter 13, we just heard it, verse 1. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. This important verse says three important things. Number one, we owe something to the governing authorities. Number two, God is the only real authority. Number three, one of the things that God has chosen to do with his authority is to place sinful, broken, imperfect people into places of authority for a purpose. Let's get into each one of these. Number one, what do we owe to be subject? And if that makes you feel uncomfortable, please know that is the same exact word Hupatasso is a Greek word. It's the same exact word used in our epistle reading when it says, Wives, submit to your husband. Same exact word. Who is the head of the family, the head of the relationship. And if that makes you feel uncomfortable, please know that in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3, God says that the head of Jesus Christ is the Father is God, the Father. Therefore, even Jesus Christ, King of kings, Lord of lords, Savior of all, submits himself to the will and to the purpose of God the Father. That submission is good. In fact, the whole Gospel of John is about Jesus saying, I do everything that is according to my Father's will. Subjection Submission can't be bad, because even our Savior did. <laughs> Submission, subjection, is only bad because of our sinfulness and the sinfulness of others. That verb, hupatasso, literally means to order under, to order under. 
This verb is a passive imperative. Why does that matter? Now, usually it doesn't matter, but here it matters. What you need to know about the passive imperative in Greek is this. The passive imperative is a command directed to you in which you are not the active doer, but rather the cooperator, the recipient of someone or something else's doing. And yet, you still maintain, retain responsibility. So who is the active doer of this ordering process? Not people, but God. God is the active doer. God is the one who likes things in order and who orders all things. Why has he done this ordering in the civil realm? To aid in keeping things in check. The very first use of the law. Peter says it this way in his epistle. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 13. He says, be subject, who put also say word, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. Whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to the governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil, and to praise those who do good. So at all levels, all levels of governing authority, we owe honor, respect, and obedience. Number two, that authority is really God's authority. Sometimes that authority is used more faithfully and wisely by those entrusted with it. Sometimes it is not. Sometimes it is not used well at all. It always only belongs to God. And as he made mankind in his image, as he made, made mankind his creation for a short while as stewards of the creation... For a short while, we are borrowing and exercising that authority at many different levels. Number three, finally, God places people in those positions of authority for a purpose. What is the purpose? That purpose, at all levels of authority in government, in business, in your very own home, in the church, anywhere that we see authority, the purpose of that authority is to serve us on God's behalf. And that authority is service, whether they know it or not. And that service is on behalf of God, whether they know it or not. A little further down in Romans 13, Paul says this, this is in verse 6, for because of this you paid taxes, he was talking about something else, for the authorities, what he's talking about, are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. The authorities are ministers of God, Paul says. The word for ministers here, it's not diakonos, I thought it wouldn't be, yeah, it's not. It's liturgos, where we get our word liturgy from. They are liturgists. Mm -hmm. What is a liturgy? Liturgy is simply this, God's public service to his people. That's what liturgy is, God's service to the public. It's what he has placed me here to do for you. And when I am not available or unable to do it for any reason, that liturgy goes to someone else. Last week, we had two deacons. Deacons Lee and Kevin lead the liturgy here in Emmanuel. I was gone on Sunday. They brought forth God's service to Emmanuel. And the liturgist is a liturgist even if their service is not perfect. Even if they mess up or like, Forget the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> Even if they forget some things or stumble over their words, God's service is done. 
They are serving the people of God on his behalf because, and here's another important point, God is the ultimate governing authority. God is the ultimate governing authority. What does the word ultimate mean? It means the last. The last. The last stop. The end point. There is no authority past God. There is no authority greater than God. He is the Alpha. He is the Omega. The beginning and the end of all things. Jesus, the Alpha and the Omega, said in his ministry, the end, Matthew chapter 18, verse 8, 18, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. God is the ultimate authority. And that may sound like a no-brainer. Yeah, of course he is. It's a no-brainer. It's true. God is God. That may sound easy. But I assure you it's not easy. Why is it not easy? It's not easy because we look to people leading us. We look to people that God has placed in positions of authority. And we say something like, are you serious, God? That is who you have chosen. Are you serious, Lord? Surely you have made a mistake. Surely you didn't mean them, Lord. Surely you didn't mean that decision, Lord. Here's the truth. God has been governing his people with sinful, broken, imperfect, and sometimes incompetent people for a long, long time. You should read the Bible. He has allowed them to be placed in positions of authority, and they are in those places in the timing and the choosing of God, even when we just know they are wrong. At the end of the day, the ultimate authority of God means that he is the authority even over us, even over me, even over you, even when we're right. And that authority for this time doesn't always live up to our sensibilities. So here's an important question. Is there ever an exception to the obedience we owe our governing authorities? Absolutely, there is. And this is the point of the sermon where you really got to listen. You really got to tune in. There may be times where civil disobedience is in order to live faithfully as the church. Civil disobedience is rightly practiced by the church when any external governing force inhibits us from being the church. So what does that mean? Precisely this. When any authority does not allow us to teach and preach God's word in purity, God's word in purity, or administer the sacraments according to Christ's institution, it's time for civil disobedience. If any authority forces us to sin against God's law, it's time for civil disobedience. And we have a perfect model of this in the life of the early, early Christian church. In the book of Acts chapter 4, we find the apostles of Jesus Christ being the witnesses they were made to be. They were teaching and they were preaching the risen Christ. The Sanhedrin, which is all of the bishops of the Jews, called them in. They really apprehended them and said, stop doing this. Stop it. Stop teaching and preaching in the name of Jesus. And the apostles said, yeah, but we're going to do it anyway. And again, in chapter 5, the apostles are brought in. And the council said, I, I thought we said stop doing this. 
And then this was Peter's reply in Acts chapter 5, verse 29. Peter and the apostles answered, we must, we must obey God rather than men. The apostles were good, law-abiding citizens. They paid ridiculous taxes to the Roman government. They submitted to the authority of the Jewish leaders. They were charged to stop teaching about Jesus. They were severely beaten for it. And the only time they were civilly disobedient was when they were told, no more of this Jesus talk. And even then, they evangelized to the Jewish leaders. And then they were let go. And then they rejoiced at the honor of suffering for Christ. At no time, at no time did the apostles, did Paul in his letters, did the early church, or the church fathers, teach the church to disobey the governing authorities in matters that did not keep them from keeping God's law in a life of word and sacrament ministry. In regards to this public health order, this is not the place to be civilly disobedient. This is not the hill for us to die on. This is not the place to make a stand. And if that makes you upset, and if that makes you anxious, and if that makes you mad, if that makes you long to practice your call to stand up in the world as a Christian, I want to say this, and I want to say it very clearly. Just wait. Just wait. That time will come, unfortunately. It will. I truly and fully believe that unless God intervenes in a major way, now listen to every word I say, okay? I truly and fully believe that unless God intervenes in a major way during my ministry, in my time as a pastor, we are on track to need to practice civil disobedience in this country. Again, unless God intervenes in a major way, which he can do, which he might do, the things that we teach and preach coming out of God's word will be considered hate speech. And we will be told to stop. <laughs> Our understanding of the teachings and things like God's created sexuality, about gender, about the unique roles of men and women will be called hate speech. They will try to force us to call evil good and good evil. We will be pushed in the direction of not protecting the most vulnerable lives among us. And the devil will like nothing more than to have us, the church, disqualify ourselves from being the witnesses the world needs by falling apart, by turning against each other, and by giving ourselves a bad name in the eyes of the world in a matter such as this. Now, these masks are uncomfortable. To some, they are unbearable. But they, as of right now, do not keep me from preaching and teaching God's word or administering in sacraments, and they do not keep you, the congregation, from receiving those things, whether in person or online. And that is thanks to many people. That is thanks to many people who have made PowerPoints and presented them. And who have manned live stream cameras, and have made ropes, and seating charts, and Christmas and Easter sign-up sheets, and checked offering boxes in the narthex, and who put our service on YouTube, and who make the radio program each week, and are part of the Zoom Bible study, and who have ran three school chapel services all last year, and taught with masks on, and cleaned pews, and sanitized 
high-priced chairs, and many, many, many other things. So this is the last thing I'll say, main point. In the time of COVID, Emmanuel has sought to be faithful to God's will. In obeying the governing authorities, while not infringing upon the commandment of Christ to continue word and sacrament ministry. And if you think that is easy, if you think it was ever done flippantly, <clears throat> if you think you've had more consternation about doing everything in the right way and being all things to all people in this congregation than myself and the deacons did, I'd like to cordially invite you to get the next candidate. It has not been fun. As a body of Christ, we need to do just as much, and in fact, much more praying as we do complaining. As the body of Christ, we need to take every opportunity we have to take advantage of our rights as Christians, to practice the distinctive call of the church in word and sacrament. As the body of Christ, we need to raise our voices higher so that the back of the room can hear when we speak of the truth of Jesus. A truth, a gospel, that is not just proclaimed to the church, but to the world. And as the body of Christ, we need to be ready to practice civil disobedience when the time comes. In a time and in a situation that we can truly say, along with the apostles, we must obey God rather than men. And we need to be ready for the day that Christ puts an end to broken and sinful civil authority by bringing us into his kingdom forever. Amen. May the peace of God which surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that in the midst of things that are difficult to bear uh, in this world, Lord, as we all seek to live faithfully as your people, Lord, that you would be our leader, that you would comfort our hearts, that we might look to you for all things, Lord, and bear with the sinful, bear with the broken, bear with all of those things in this life that makes it hard to follow you, Lord, that you would make us effective witnesses in this world, both today and in the days that are coming, um, that we might continually, always, um, be prepared to give a reason for the hope that is in us to the world around us. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity, uh, and we beg that your kingdom come swiftly. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing.
Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are known, grant us true faith, that we would honor you not only with our lips, but serve you faithfully with all of our heart, mind, and strength. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. Gracious Lord, give joy and hope to all your children in remembrance of their baptism that they may rejoice in the forgiveness of sins that Christ freely pours out in his saving blood. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, preserve us from rejecting your commandments for the doctrines of men. By your Spirit's aid, lead all Christians to keep your commandments in thought, word, and deed, honoring you in all that we do. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Preserve, O oh Lord, your estate of marriage. Grant that wives would submit to their husbands, and husbands love their wives as Christ loved the church, and gave himself up for her. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious Father, bless children of all ages, so that they would not despise or anger their father and mother, but always honor them, serve and obey them, love and cherish them. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Lord of life, guide and lead those facing difficult life and death decisions to make God pleasing ones, affirming that life is a precious gift from you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear our prayers for our nation and its leaders, for all civil servants and for those whose work imperils them for the sake of their neighbor. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of life, encourage with your word and grace all who suffer physically, emotionally, and spiritually on account of illness. Lord, this day we ask that you would be with uh, both Mary and Clark Halbert, both suffering from COVID, Lord. Uh, we ask that you would provide healing according to your will and in your timing. Lord, especially that you be with our brother Clark, who is hospitalized right now, receiving treatments. Um, we ask that you would be with him in the days ahead, Lord, which seems that he's doing better. We ask that you continue to give him improvements. Lord, be with our brother Jim Nicholas, who um, is suffering a pretty bad leg infection after a recent foot surgery, Lord, um, being treated for that in this time, that you would relieve that pain and that you would take that um, infection away. For our sister Carol B. Singh, Lord, who's um, in trouble right now with uh, having a hard time regulating her blood sugar, Lord, um, not feeling well at all because of it. We ask that you would be with her and provide her relief. For um, our teacher, Mark Potter's uh, mother, who has been hospitalized with COVID pneumonia, Lord, we ask that you would provide her um, healing in this time. For um, those who mourn the, the passing of loved ones, Lord, we ask this day that you would bless um, all of the family and loved ones.
one. So Joe Middleton, a former member of Emmanuel who um, passed away recently. And you would also be with the family and loved ones of uh, Judy Kensing, who also passed away. Lord, that all might be remembered of your great promises of the resurrection found in Jesus Christ alone. Lord, we ask that you would be with a um, friend of Kay Anderson, uh, Crystal and her daughter, um, who are going through serious health, uh, family issues in this time, that you would bless them and provide the strength and protection they need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Strengthen the faith and sustain to life everlasting all who partake in the fellowship of this altar and receive Christ's body and blood this day in the Holy Communion. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. God foresees our needs and plans for our lives. He invites us to follow as he leads. He always arranges for our eternal welfare. Praise to you, O Lord. You do all things well for us and for our salvation. Grant us sincere hearts and willing feet. Amen. Jesus institutes the sacrament of his body and blood, by which he brings forgiveness to his people. To neglect the Lord's Supper is to ignore the forgiveness Christ earned for us. Come now to the Lord's Supper, for his table has been prepared for you. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the very same night that he was betrayed, took bread. After giving thanks, he broke it, giving it to his disciples, and saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in the remembrance of me. In the same way, also, when supper had ended, he took the cup. Giving thanks once again, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Do this as often as you drink of it. In the remembrance of me. O Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to be temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the night is in you, of the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
see it one more time. I did forget one announcement at the beginning. Tomorrow morning we're going to be, although this is already done with the first week of school, we will be installing Mrs. Katie Brandon as teacher of Emmanuel. So somebody to be thinking about and praying about, thanking God for her. Um, and congratulate her when you see her. So that will take place tomorrow morning, the early service. Go on God's peace, this is yourself.